Good afternoon. My name is Yenny Wong, and I am a first-year full-time MBA student. And this is Samuel Kwan, a senior at UCLA, majoring in business economics. We're student directors of today's entrepreneurship, investment, and growth strategies panel discussion, focused on trends, investment patterns, and opportunities for private entrepreneurship, foreign investment in China, and China's outbound investment. The United States and China are experiencing strong and steady economic growth, which has been accompanied by increasing cross-border investment opportunities. Under President Xi, uh, tech and internet entrepreneurship have been encouraged. The future outlook becomes more interesting with the Belt and Road Initiative, which will provide new bright spots for investment, with new opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship. Our panelists will share insights on investment trends and their perspectives on the opportunities and challenges ahead, as well as discuss the need for new strategies and partnerships. We are delighted to welcome the following speakers in, in this panel. Wei Guo, founding partner of Honest Capital. Richard Jun, co-founder and managing director, BAM Ventures. John Ho, chief executive officer, Lansay Homes. And Maggie Sun, partner, Capital Markets Accounting Advisory Deal, PwC. This panel will be moderated by proud UCLA alumnus, James Rice, um, president and CEO of Solaris Paper, where he leads an aggressive five-year growth plan. James previously served as vice president of Parent Asia Pulp and Paper, and has been working in China continuously since 1991, having served in positions such as CEO of Chinese liquor company, Shui Jingfang, and president of Tyson Foods China. He also served on the Board of Governors of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai for five elected terms. Please join me and welcome our moderator and panelists. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's do a little deeper introduction of our uh, panelists today. So uh, on the far right, or your far left I should say, is uh, Wei Guo. He's currently with Up Honest Capital and he's a founding partner there. He's been there since uh, 2016. And Wei, I think the best description of him is a, is a serial angel investor because he's been in Silicon Valley for a long time and has invested in more than 260 companies and I think has more than 100 companies even now under active yeah. investment, is that correct? And including Scout, Boom, TBH, which was bought by Facebook, uh, Native, which was bought by P&G, Worklife, Monkey, Limebike, and so on. And we'll ask him to go into more details a little bit later, but uh, some a very successful track record there. Uh, next to him, John Ho. John is the U.S. CEO of Land Sea Homes, and he's responsible for all of U.S. operations. That includes acquisitions, development, sales of residential properties and their services. And before joining Land Sea, John worked for some other leading real estate firms and has a, a lot of involvement in Chinese outbound investments, so investments coming towards the U.S. So I think we'll have some good insights there. And he comes to us with an undergraduate degree from another university on the other side of town. <laughs> but we give him credit for uh, coming to this place for a good MBA. So uh, thank you, John. And uh, then we have Richard Jun, also a, another serial angel investor. And uh, Richard graduated from Harvard University and went to Columbia Law School. So I think, can we describe you as a lawyer not doing law anymore? Please. There's a lot, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, founder and managing partner of BAM Ventures, uh, and we'll ask you to describe that in a few minutes. Uh, uh, Richard was also with Shoe Dazzle's senior management team, and uh, earlier practiced corporate law, right? So. And finally, uh, on my right is Maggie Swin, and uh, we're really pleased to have you here, also from PwC. And, and you know, there's so many parts of PwC, so I'm going to ask you what part in a few minutes, so you can describe that. But 20 years of uh, experience in advisory and audit, which means you started when you were 12. Right? Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. And uh, uh, that includes working with state-owned companies, private companies, uh, and acquisitions, IPOs, and venture, venture capital, and money going from here to there and there to here. So uh, uh, our, our panelists have a lot of things to say. So if we could start off first, let's start off uh, with Richard. Could you just tell us what is BAM Ventures and, and what do you do? Great. Um, so BAM Ventures is an early stage uh, startup fund. 
this is something that uh, we built in 2013, myself and my partner, Brian Lee. You may have heard of Brian. He is the uh, co-founder and former CEO of The Honest Company. He also built another company called uh, LegalZoom, which is probably the first company that a lot of entrepreneurs uh, visit uh, to uh, you know, incorporate or start up their, their own companies. Our second company together was called Shoe Dazzle, and that's when we built a shoe subscription box around Kim Kardashian, who was Paris Hilton's uh, best friend back then because she was a celebrity that we could afford. So uh, we, we actually had uh, some success building companies here in Los Angeles. We came to an epiphany in 2014 that um, LA was definitely a investable ecosystem. We were seeing a lot of our smart friends wanting to start uh, building their own companies. They came to us for advice uh, and or a small check and uh, we quickly realized that uh, this was a viable business plan. Uh, we think we've invested in some of the top uh, leading consumer companies coming out of Los Angeles. We've broadened kind of our geographic aperture a little bit and now we invest uh, globally. We, uh, we invest out of Korea. We're constantly looking for other companies in Asia. We've actually been fortunate enough to have a pretty sizable exit uh, investing in a Korean Bitcoin exchange. Our goal is always to invest early, invest broadly, lead in with our money as well as our ex expertise and scar tissue that we have from, uh, from a couple of the ventures that we've started. Uh, parallel to the investment side, we have uh, essentially an incubator where we're looking at very early stage opportunities where we can go in, bring in the right, invest, bring in the right value add investors, layer in our capital and really uh, help build companies with the founders and, and get them to scale pretty quickly. So that's what we do. And what, what do you do? Oh, so um, uh, I said a lot, but there aren't too many of us. We're, we're a very linear organization. So we have three partners on the investment side. It's myself, Brian, uh, we decided to bring in another partner. She's been great for us. She was the first check into Sweetgreen and a couple other very large consumer companies. We felt that as a consumer focused fund, it was good to have a different face and voice uh, since Brian and I are just older Asian American men. So <laughs> it, uh, I think we've constructed the team the right way. Uh, I lead the investment side of what we do on the, in BAM Ventures. And Maggie, you know, there's, PwC's a big animal. Yeah. And yeah. What, what part are you in? Um, I'm a deals partner based in San Francisco, uh, focused in capital markets, accounting and advisory services. I'm also a uh, member of our PwC China Business Network, uh, which helps Chinese companies doing business in the U.S. and helping American companies going to the China market. And first of all, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here at UCLA and Anderson School. And since I landed in the Bay Area about a year ago, um, I heard about Wilbur Wu Conference. And I was uh, so much looking forward to be part of it. And I know how much uh, work has been put in by the uh, students and uh, faculty members to put the event together. And PwC is a proud sponsor of this event for the seventh year. So more on myself, uh, I originally grew up in Beijing and uh, after high school I went to New York City where I spent 16 years. And then the next 10 years I was back in Beijing. So I moved back to San Francisco last year and I spent over 20 years in accounting and advisory and audit practices with uh, big four accounting firms. Okay. And Wei, can you explain your company? I'm, I have trouble managing one company, and if you've got 200, I, I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> basically, we are a cross-border LACG VC firm based in Silicon Valley, and uh, we do a lot of uh, technical deals. And recently, we started investing a uh, like, lot of international students from China. And uh, we did a company like I don't know if you I don't know if you heard about that company. Uh, uh, we did a company like Arca Media. They are like one of the largest MCN uh, in uh, Douyin. Uh, a little, little background about myself. So I was uh, raised born in China, Shandong province. We discussed about that. And I uh, yeah. went to Singapore for high school. 
and I came here 2008. I was uh, attending a school <coughs> in San Francisco. I actually applied my MBA uh, here, uh, uh, but I, 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 I didn't have a chance to uh, get us accepted. Um, <laughs> but but uh, you see, well, are you on the panel now? Well, <laughs> so you're ex accepted. Yeah. Well, yeah. So uh, UC, UC Davis accepted me, and uh, at, at that time there uh, there was a super hot market in entrepreneurial world. Uh, so <coughs> Chinese government announced uh, Shuang Chang. That uh, like I don't know the face English, but I can explain in, in Chinese. Da Zhong Chang Xin Wan Zhong Chang Ye. At that time, there's uh, a lot of hot capital from China down to Silicon Valley. So I thought I thought that was a great opportunity. I dropped out from UC Davis and quickly raised my fund from. Alibaba from Tencent, uh, from uh, Fuli Di Chen, Fuli Di Chen, uh, Longhu Di Chen, and uh, Xinri Toutiao, and IDG China, Seco, uh, not Seco, IDG China, <coughs> and a uh, uh, lot of great VC firms. Um, now I'm managing $100 million. Yeah. All right. John, Lancy, how long has it been here? In the uh, we've been here in the United States for five years. Um, I feel like I'm the least smart on this panel because I don't do any high tech or anything uh, <laughs> as exciting like consumer moderator. products. Yeah. <laughs> We're a real estate developer and home builder, a very traditional industry. We're a Chinese company by background, uh, founded in Nanjing in 2001. I joined the company in 2013 to start the US division. So in August of 2013, we had nothing here in the United States. Today, we are a $700 million, $700 million uh, company uh, in the United States. We have 13 <laughs> active communities that we are building and selling in California, Boston, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, we are about 25% of our global assets now, and our U.S. division is about 30% of our uh, global profits as well. Uh, a little bit about Myself, as uh, James mentioned, I did go to the other school across town. Uh, I came to my census and I came here for my MBA. Uh, I'm currently a student, so I'm very happy that they let me speak. Uh, I'm graduating this June, and I've, uh, it's been a fascinating journey for me uh, these past decade in navigating the U.S.-China relationship, having worked both in China and working here, uh, and it's a very turbulent time that we're in today, and I look forward to talking about it on this panel and also answering any questions that fellow students have. Richard, do you think a uh, Chinese company should raise money from a U.S. venture capital? I think, um, you know, obviously money is the lifeblood of any business, um, but I think people should be really careful about uh, one, you know, not raising too much money, and then also understanding what it means to take money from a, from a VC. Um, just to shift this question a little bit, when we look at uh, investing in a company, especially from someone abroad, right, we always ask the question, does that business really stand to gain by becoming global? Is it too early? Uh, why are they interested in taking U.S. money if they haven't really proven that they can own a, their local market, if it's a local business, or if it's a fully scaled global business, then it kind of makes sense. And then you go to the next tier of questions, sort of, is this company that's better suited to raise from Silicon Valley investors, or is it more, uh, is it more conditioned to raise from Los Angeles investors where we feel we do consumer slightly better just because we have a much more diverse uh, demographic where you can kind of test a product to see if it, it sells. So uh, I know I avoided that question a little bit, but uh, if you are starting a company, uh, you've got to understand what it is you're building and where the value is. If you're building something that works well in your locality, for us to be interested, you really do have to prove out certain uh, proof points where it's working in your market and then sell us on the global opportunity. Then we come in and say, okay, you should take our money here and this is where I can help. And as you look for investors, you're going to not only understand that they're the money, but because even more so than any other startup that comes through our door, you're going to need a lot of help, right? Because culturally, there may be some issues. You might not have the relationships that you would other ha otherwise have in your home locality. So uh, for a sundry of reasons, 
you need to do your homework about your company, the company's opportunity, why you want to raise money here, and who the right investors are uh, here in Los Angeles. And again, I'm sorry, Los Angeles, Silicon Valley, New York. And each ecosystem kind of does something really, really well. So uh, the, the short of it is just look at your company and see what fits. Okay, actually, an ecosystem was a, a question I wanted to throw away, yep. which is related, is uh, are the companies you're investing in, are they big, small, are they starting up, are they Chinese, are they American, or is, is it LA, Silicon Valley, and what, give us some color, what, what are you looking at? Uh, so I start with uh, technical, technical companies in Silicon Valley, right. and, uh, and then I quickly found out that a lot of uh, technical company has a problem with uh, fitting the right market. Um, and <coughs> so I start to look comp uh, companies that outside Silicon Valley. Like I found out that there's a lot of great consumer companies in LA. So I, uh, last year I started to invest in companies in LA. Uh, so far we have like 10 portfolio companies. I, I think uh, Richard was, I definitely agree with Richard at one point, the consumer companies here are like the best in the world. And uh, there's there's great company, like, great companies like Dollar Shift Club, uh, the the honest company, mm -hmm. and uh, these companies, uh, from my point of view, they can, they are, they can possibly be more globalized than than all these technical companies in Silicon Valley, and uh, uh, something related to this point is, uh, uh, this year we start to look at all the international students, Chinese international students mar uh, market. Uh, we did a research, there are about a $50 billion market just in the US for Chinese international students, uh, but certainly including the tuition. Um, LA is leading this industry. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, um, is that the way that foreign companies viewed China, that Shanghai was the consumer market? If you start in Shanghai first, then you go everywhere else? Is, are you looking at Los Angeles for America? Uh, I mean, I, I'm looking at Los Angeles for for global. I think uh, like all the influence, uh, I'll give you an example. So the influencers in Los Angeles, they're leading the fashion, leading the trend of consumer products. Whatever they use, they are followed by all the uh, like Western world fans and then, and then uh, followed by the, like, the other, okay. other part of the world for fans. So uh, basically if you get, um, you get an insight here, and then you can you, you have a better understanding of the like the consumer market as a whole. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, Maggie, how do you see entrepreneurship, like what they're talking about, developing in China? Do you see that also? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I wanted to share some of my uh, own experience as well. So um, I mentioned that I spent ten years in Beijing and arrived the end of two thousand six. As many of you have been to Beijing before, in addition to the original Zhongguan Tun High Technology Science Park, uh, which the government set up back in the 80s and 90s to attract innovative company such as Lenovo or Baidu. So over the past years, uh, many additional um, science parks were added to that, uh, including Yizhuang or Shangdi. So at the government level, um, entrepreneurship and in innovation has always been highly promoted. So I would say Chinese entrepreneurship started uh, in the late days when the government, the country started to open the door to the West. And that followed by innovation and technology in the 90s. So the fast economic growth in China over the past two decades are uh, contributed by you know, growth of state-owned enterprises, SOEs, as well as private sectors um, and a rising number of Chinese entrepreneurs. So as of now, uh, China has the second largest number of unicorns in the world, which is right behind uh, the United States. <coughs> so unicorns are defined as a private companies with uh, market cap, um, market valuation less than $1 billion. So um, when I worked with the uh, Chinese entrepreneurs back in China, and their companies are small and later grow to be a company um, you know, listed in the US. So I have found these entrepreneurs are extremely ambitious and they're very hardworking, have very strong ability uh, 
learning ability and they're very optimistic about their country's future. So many of them have overseas experience. Uh, if not, they would bring people with overseas background into the management team. And they're, they're very quick in adapting to changes and the challenges. And uh, one of the most important factors I wanted to mention, or attributes I wanted to mention, is that they are very innovative in business models, which make them very successful in the vast China market. And are they innovative in funding? Could they be funded by somebody here or somebody there? Does it matter? I would are say this, uh, the, uh, emphasize business model because a lot of people are saying that over the years, Chinese companies have been copying everything from the West and you know, make it su successful in China. But if you look closely, actually, especially over the past uh, more recent years, they have been very innovative in you know, making their own business model that's workable in China. Right. right. Uh, John, what, what are the compelling reasons for Chinese investors like the parent company for you, for you to be investing in the U.S.? We always think of China as a great growth market. Right. Like, what are you doing here? Can't speak for all of the Chinese companies, <laughs> but at least for our company, <laughs> diversification. We didn't have, want to have all our eggs in one basket. We didn't want to be in one market. We didn't want to be bound by one political uh, system. So as a private company, we wanted to diversify globally. Uh, in China, we are a residential home building company. That is what we do. It is the first or maybe second largest uh, market for that in the world. The United States would be the next one. So for us to diversify as a company, we wanted to be in another large residential market, uh, and that was the United States. So for us, it's been a diversification strategy, um, both geographically and polit politically. Uh, and we look at the U.S. as a long-term market for us. We're one that is negatively correlated with China. Uh, for us, for our shareholders, they can invest in they can invest in Land C and look at a company that's got diversified holdings, real estate portfolio that's in bo both countries, and you can hedge against risks in each of them. And what what can you bring? Any technology, any competencies, or do you have to buy everything? Do you? I think initially it was money. Uh, uh -huh. If anything, everyone tells you anything differently. <laughs> I don't know. I would be hard pressed to 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 look at a real estate company and come into the United States and offer something new into this market. However, I do think there are industries in the United States that have gone too long without any innovation. And residential and home building and construction is one of them. I think the things that are being done in not just China but in Asia are so much advanced in terms of construction and sustainability and smart technology in your homes and all these things that are being built in places like Japan and Hong Kong and Shanghai or Beijing are phenomenal. The interiors are phenomenal. The space planning is great. The amenities are amazing. I think there are real things now, uh, as we've been in this market for about five years now, that we can put into our communities that are different than American uh, developers, uh, that bring uh, a international or global uh, uh, touch or design to two projects here, and, and offer it to American consumers that want innovation, that want uh, differentiation, and, and I believe uh, today want sustainability. Okay. So here's a question, for, could be any of you, but for anybody in, in this room that had a great business idea and wanted to start a company, uh, where's the source of money? Where's the source of capital? Do you, do you have an idea? You know, offer a, throw a bone? Uh, sure. Um. Well, uh, lucky for you, there's actually a lot of money just uh, parked right now, uh, ready to back a good idea. So uh, I think this goes beyond whether you know, you're Chinese, Korean, or foreign national. If you've got a good idea and you have the conviction to really go after it and find money, then you do what everyone before you has done, which is work your Rolodex, understand uh, 
where your potential investor may come from. There's a certain cadence and a pattern to raising money. The first is always going to be friends and family. They're going to be the ones where you're going to get the least amount of pushback and a lot of trust. But with that comes a lot of responsibility as well. You're going to get to a proof point. Then you're going to work your network to get into the right investors who invest in your idea. And you've got to be prepared for those meetings, right? You need to sit there and understand and anticipate all the questions that they're going to ask about the business, be ready to address them, uh, show some passion, and, and convince someone that you're, you're worthy of, of taking their money and you'll, you'll, you'll utilize it to, to grow it into a big business. So um, the, the good news is the money's out there and you don't have to do anything untried. But the, the bad news or just the reality of it is you've got to work hard and get your message and your idea and your passion for your business out there and hopefully you'll get funded. And Wei, how often do, how often do you hear business pitches? Uh, probably, I got a lot of cold emails, probably yeah. like 20 cold emails a day. Oh yeah. And then uh, I, pay, I pay a lot of attention on the like special, special cold emails. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I think um, to add some point is um, the circle you are in is very important for, for fundraising. I mean, like you, uh, there's a lot of great alumni from uh, UCLA, like you, you can speak to about uh, advising of raising money. And uh, you said that I can add some point about fundraising in China. I think there's like a tremendous amount of money in China uh, that are interested in equity investment. Uh, that changed in past a uh, few years uh, from top to bottom, from top government. Um, mm -hmm. they, they have a lot of fund fund to invest VC firms like us. And uh, a lot of VC firms, junior partner, they jump out, they start their own fund. Uh, and there's a lot of family office start to uh, invest in which, which I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a big thing. Because uh, past few years ago, just past few years ago, there's only few people understand what is VC and what is uh, equity investment. Uh, right now, like uh, I think basically everybody knows about it. Uh, there's also a lot of new method you can do your fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see, like ICO, crypto uh, offering, and uh, raise, raising money is really not a like barrier anymore. It's not that hard. Well, while you're talking, and you're a young investor, you're, you're yeah. definitely a different kind of investor, but what are, can you share with us a little insight? Like, what, is, what, are your, what are your principles? What are you looking for? What is uh, what's sort of driving your investment decisions? Uh, I, we, we've done a lot of research. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot of study about uh, the trend. Um, and uh, the advantage we have is we can compare to market. Uh, I think uh, Maggie mentioned there used to be a, uh, like a thought that a lot of Chinese company copy, uh, copy Silicon Valley or LA. And nowadays, there's, uh, business, business model-wise, there's a lot of great Chinese companies that have more advanced business model, uh, like companies like Xiaomi and uh, uh, Musical.ly, which is bought by Total, right? They're all, they, they, they invent this new uh, business model. And, um, so we can compare these two market, and then find a best way that fit our strategy. This is number one. Number two, we we uh, we done a lot of research on on the team, uh, you know, on the founder. I think the learning skill of the founder is the like most important uh, thing for for the for the team, and uh, and and the, the circle you have is pretty important. Meg, I think you might have a good pulse on this. And we've got, a, since we've got a lot of students out there. Where are the jobs going to be in the future? I see it perhaps. I should ask everybody that question, by the way. Half of the students here, right? But the other half <laughs> yeah. are not students. Okay. But we're well, we all want to know that question, yeah. the, the answer. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think there's one thing has been talked about um, a lot. You know, will our job be replaced by robots in the future? So that's really a big topic, and uh, I, I think it's uh, absolutely worth digging into that a little bit because I started being an accountant, audit, you know, doing audit, 
doing vouching, you go to the client and sitting in front of the computer as a first year or second year auditor, you know, doing a lot of spreadsheets, et cetera. So that job has been, well, in the process of being replaced by robots, or robot, not necessarily just, you know, the, the robots walking around, but a lot of, uh, you know, basic machines, analytical tools. Yeah. If you are still in school studying and uh, you're still uh, making decision on what to learn in the future, for the future. So that's something that you wanted to keep in mind. You don't want to you know, go into a certain field that is going to become obsolete, replaced by machines in, in 10 years. I think AI is definitely replacing a lot of jobs, but it's also, there's a lot of new type of job came out. Uh, I'll give you an example of uh, what I saw. Like, uh, there's a lot of MCN or internet influencer from Douyin or uh, Kuaishou, like are uh, from Dongbei province, <laughs> like in, in China, like mm -hmm. that. And, and when you open the traditional media channel, you saw, you saw a lot of ce celebrities, Chinese celebrities are from Dongbei province. I mean, that's a trend that internet or new technologies is creating new jobs. So don't worry about like um, AI stuff yeah. Yeah. or <laughs> robotic stuff, yeah. I think some uh, practical advice. Uh, you know, we, we also get uh, cold called emails or LinkedIn outreaches. Uh, we got so many that I actually had our associate just kind of do a regression analysis to see how many of those actually led to an invested deal, and it came out to zero, right? Like, so <laughs> the, <laughs> which <laughs> I tell you, uh, uh, we try to be responsive to everything, but uh, the, the probability of us investing in something from a, hey, glad we connected on LinkedIn, you know, do you want to take a look at my pitch deck, really didn't work well for us, even though we, we've tried. Um, and I think because uh, now we're awash with great companies, right? So you're competing against someone else. You know, we take probably three or four phone call pitch meetings, one or two pitch, actual pitch meetings a day. So you're competing with people who are coming in with their own passion, a passionate opportunity. So it really is, we like you, but do we like you more than this other person that we're gonna write, write and check? So you really have to prime the room the right way. And that really means getting in front of the VC or the investor or your potential employer in a way where they're inclined to believe in this and to invest in you. And a lot of it does have to, have to do with the right introduction, getting someone to phrase your, you and the opportunity in your company in the right way where we're sort of like, yes, okay, you've, you have the initial filter of coming through a credible source that we trust. And that really makes it a lot easier for us to place our investment and our, and our trust in you. So I really think that you know, what's held me uh, in good stead uh, after college is just being very good at what you do and just being very aggressive about uh, networking and being known for the right reasons. And, and so I stand here not because I think I'm the smartest investor, but I, I've done a good job of fostering great relationships that have led me to a lot of success. And then at some point it just starts to uh, kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a virtuous uh, circle where your success builds on success and it just gets easier. But, uh, you know, you can learn everything from a textbook. I'm not saying drop out of school, but uh, the goal here is also to network with the future Mark Zuckerbergs and the people who are going to build the next great companies, and that's where your job is going to come from. One thing to add to that, there are, when I started out, when I graduated from the other school and I started out in real estate in um, Southern California, I went to go work for a real estate company, uh, multinational real estate company. There were zero people in the entire company in Los Angeles that were bilingual. There were zero people in that company that worked in Los Angeles that knew anything about the Asian markets and Chinese markets. That's changed a lot since I graduated. There's, I think there's more um, multicultural, multilingual people um, that are here in Los Angeles that are in different industry and in different fields. As that becomes more competitive, there are still a real lack of people that have expertise in certain industries and verticals. And if I could give any advice or if I could uh, pass anything on is get really good at something. Get really good at a skill, whether it's financial modeling, whether it's sales, whether it's marketing. Develop some real strong technical skills 
And then the fact that you're all sitting here in a China conference tells me that you have a passion or understanding of language and culture as well. And then you layer that on top of it. We're probably in the most interesting time um, right now between for US-China relations, which is the biggest commercial relationship in the world right now. They're, without you know, just the fact that our president threatens trade war every day just tells you how, how important it is today. And when there's incredible conflict, there's also incredible opportunity for you all to go and go solve those problems. Go out there, take the skills that you've learned, take the knowledge, the culture, the experience that you have, and go fix those problems, whether it's in industry or politics. Uh, but it's incredible opportunity for, to, to do that. But you gotta have technical skills. You gotta have things that you can offer an organization that will help guide them to make better decisions. Just, uh, you know, those are absolutely the table stakes in order for you to be considered for a position, right? You can't just walk in and say, hey, I'm a good guy, a nice guy, hire me. Um, I just want to underscore the other, what you said, which is uh, you're bilingual. Use that to your advantage. Every one of my companies in my portfolio, and I have a lot of them, uh, not as much as Wei, but we're pretty prolific as well. Um, I think if you can credibly go into their office and talk to the CEO and say, hey, um, I know China is an important market to you. To every company, China is an important market. Let me figure out your China strategy. And, and not only say that, but actually back it up with a plan, right? Now you're actually very viable for an internal hire because everyone needs to think through a China strategy within two or three years of having turned that uh, corner of being around, right? Like once you, you struggle and make sure you're going to be around in the next two or three years, once you get, once you escape that infant mortality uh, band, then you think about, okay, U.S. market's great. We have a strategy for that. China's a big black box, right? But they know that it's important enough. And if you can credibly go in there with a plan that really helps them figure out an Asia strategy or a China strategy because you have a relationship or you understand the local market better than they do, then you've got a job and that gets you in the room and then from there you've built a career. That's probably a good poll call on every company in America given that only 2% of U.S. companies export and half of those are to Mexico and Canada. Yep. There's a lot of open space. So Maggie, now talk about trade war. We won't talk about trade war, but I don't believe it. But uh, there's Chinese policy changes yep. and maybe a little bit of U.S. policy changes going to affect us. Yeah, one of the things that uh, the main theme of this uh, year's conference is related to the, uh, uh, the 19th um, Congress, Party mm -hmm. Congress, which took place October 2017. And so in the earlier panels, people talk about FDI's outbound investment. And I'm going to just give you a little more background on that. Um, for the FDI, foreign direct investment into China, it declined in 2017 after two decades of uh, rapid growth. So, you know, the reason behind that is rising um, cost of labor, because, you know, I spent the past 10 years in China, and I see that in my profession, my, I work for a big four accounting firm, people's, uh, you know, paycheck at uh, significant increase um, year over year. So, uh, so for a lot of uh, labor intensive uh, manufacturing job operating in China, there's no advantage anymore. So they have to move to low cost neighboring countries such as Vietnam, uh, Malaysia or Indonesia. And the other reason that causing the um, decline in the foreign direct investment into China is the termination of a lot of incentives for foreign companies doing business in China by the government. Two decades ago, when the uh, Chinese government wanted to attract foreign investment into the China market, they offered a series of uh, benefits, you know, including government subsidies, tax reductions, and you know, low cost for uh, renting land and all that uh, or many of that have disappeared over the past few years. I, I think one of the things is because the rapid economic growth over the past two decades. So the government realized, hey, now is the time for us to make sure the Chinese companies and the foreign companies doing business in China are playing in the um, you know, equal playing field. 
So despite all, all that, um, we think that uh, you know, during the 19th uh, Party Congress, um, uh, they, they laid out that um, <coughs> going forward, there will be still um, um, increased opportunity for technology and uh, modern manufacturing and modern service sectors. And uh, um, so that's, you know, that's really the policy uh, change. And one thing I do want to mention that a lot of you are in this field. So last year, 2017, the outbound investment out, out of China decreased, mainly caused by the restrictions po imposed mm -hmm. by the government. Uh, so certain factor, uh, sectors are affected, including real estate, hotel, film, studios, entertainment, and the sports club. So as many of you know, that the Chinese people are big um, soccer fans. So just in Europe alone, I believe over 20 plus uh, sports clubs have been bought by Chinese investors over the years. Um, so I guess to summarize, um, there are three broad areas for future investment out of this, you know, um, that's basically out of this uh, uh, um, party congress. So one area is innovation and technology. And the second one is related to uh, people's well-being, meaning education, uh, elderly care, health care, and uh, food safety. And uh, so, you know, I think going forward, the other thing I want to mention is the One Belt, One Row initiative, which, which is a China-driven, a new model of international economic cooperation is going to lead the way for uh, China outbound investment. But wait, if China says innovation and they won't invest in innovation, but really 90% of your investment is here. So innovation is happening here, not there, right? Mm, depends on what, come, what kind of uh, innovation. So uh, I invest 90% here is because I think, um, we think, we think there's a better way of, uh, about these two countries' corporations. Uh, so China has a huge market. And uh, Silicon Valley has uh, technology that f can fit the market, and there's huge amount of capital in, in China, uh, and th that want to like acquire the, the technology, or uh, in the sense of like uh, partnership of this kind of technology, and um, and uh, recently we saw that uh, there's a lot of uh, technology. Guy, a te a technical guy are like Chinese. Uh, once they are, uh, they learn and they uh, get ready in Silicon Valley. They uh, they go back to start their stocks in, in China. So th that's why we have another ten percent um, of portfolio in China. And then we we saw the trend. It's uh, pretty clear. There, there there are going to be more technical people uh, going back to China. Are you looking at in the future is almost borderless like a just a circle between the market, the technology, the, the uh, consumer, the capital. I think. I think. I think uh, yeah. Does I, it I matter to you that there's a border? There's no ocean. I think global globalization is is going faster than beyond our imagination. Um, so uh, there's a lot of Chinese business business model are uh, done pretty successful in Silicon Valley. Uh, one company, uh, one my portfolio company, you just mentioned Landback. Uh, they are kind of like. Uh, O O F O and Mobile, uh, Mobile in Silicon Valley, right? they they growing faster than the China market, but the business model are from China. Another example, actually in L A, is uh, all these streaming mobile streaming company uh, were popular in, mm -hmm. in China, but they're now making great money. And then once they move to America, uh, one of the companies <laughs> called uh, Live Dot Me, and yeah. they they growing. The market is bigger than, than China. So uh, we saw a lot of these smaller changes. Uh, and we are, we are an entrepreneurial VC firm, so we, we kind of like changing when this small little piece changing. Yeah. And John, you see this, we are almost old school your industry of real estate development, right? But you see that trend going the same way, capital, uh, at the end of the day, we build homes, and yeah. I believe everybody lives in a home. Everybody here. lives in a home. So it is one of those timeless industries <laughs> that will always be here. Um, 
but how we live and, and, and the way we live is changing. The millennials, the next generation, your definition of a, you know, a home or, and how that community, your commute, all these things have huge impacts on our developments and, 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 and the investments that we're making. Uh, it, and, and returns are also changing as well. So a lot of the reason why we're here in the United States is because the real, there is a real estate bubble in China. Everyone knows that. And it's a real bubble, and it's a real big concern if this government cannot continue to prop it up. Um, there's a huge debt overhang over there. It makes companies like ours that invest a lot of money go, go buy land, land um, very concerned. Uh, so we look at the U.S. as a market that is, is, is certainly is still riding the tide. Maybe we're in a later inning in this real estate cycle. Uh, but there's still a runway here, and we're investing, and we're still buying a lot more land this year uh, to continue to build homes and deliver homes um, and, and do it profitably. Um, and that will change. We will have a downturn cycle here, uh, and, and then, then the China market will recover, and they will also have a great market as well. So uh, globalization, being diversified, um, being able to invest in different markets, um, should be any investor or any shareholders, I think, um, uh, should be a part of their strategy. How long does it take to get $5 million out of China into the United States? First, John, how do you do it? Because we've read in, in the, a lot of mag magazines and online what's going on. And what do you tell clients and how quickly can you get that money out from China? to a bank account in Los Angeles. I guess we can have a private session on that. <laughs> so a lot of, uh, I think it's overall, maybe I just start, just start this, because I think John's gonna have more practical experience you know, with his <laughs> company. Uh, first of all, you have to go through the uh, government uh, approval process and to have legi legitimate uh, documents to support this money transfer outbound. And uh, so now, you know, given the restrictions added that I, I mentioned out of the uh, 19th Party Congress, so it's going to be more difficult. You know, so for certain industries, you have to go through certain government bodies to, to get the approval. So, and then I'll pass it to John to share exactly, if you wanted to share, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly how to get the money out of China. <laughs> <laughs> Officially, <laughs> yeah, I presume it was illegal. We stopped, be legal. <laughs> we stopped bringing capital here from China, I would say, a year and a half ago. So, especially in real estate, we can't do it now. So, we saw this coming, our chairman saw this coming uh, two years ago. So, everything that we've invested, we've invested about um, $700 million here in the United States. We did all that between 2013 and 16. And that capital is here to stay. You know, we're going to continue to reinvest that. So we haven't brought any new capital in. However, um, what is the Chinese saying? Um, there's, a, any, there's a proverb for this in Chinese. Um, and, and there are many, many channels uh, uh, in China. There are many banking institutions. No, no on, officially. There are many banking institutions. There are many free trade zones. Um, if you can find something that has to do with one belt, one road, <laughs> you will find a way. Um, because people continue to do that. We sell homes to consumers um, from China, and they figure out a way. Um, and uh, you know, it's a big country, it's a lot of people. There's a, there's a way, uh, there's a will, there's a way. It is just more difficult. There are more processes that you have to go to. There are more um, packaging and that you have to put around it, and uh, you can do it. Um, you just have to navigate the um, system and the policies that are in place. Um, but people are still doing it. Uh, it's just and also not the, as clear. And also the $50,000 individual limit was released on a few cities yeah. yesterday or the day before. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for being here today. Super insightful discussion so far. Um, I'm Anderson student graduating in two months, and uh, I've had the opportunity to work with both the Tech Coast Angels here in LA, as well as the Pritzker Group Venture Capital. 
internship with them. And my question's around um, kind of the investment thesis in VC firms in China, right? We talk about amount of kind of analytical rigor and research that's, that's done here in forming a thesis and investing in your startups around the thesis in various sectors. Talk about a little bit the, the VC firm that's popped up in the last you know, five years in China. Is it kind of bad money going to bad startups or do they have the same amount of rigor as we do here in America? Away, I think. Yeah. You want to try that? Uh, I, I don't think that. So China and US market are, are like totally different. Totally different? So, totally, totally different. So I, I give you an example. Like for, um, so for some um, probably very hard deals in China, they can raise three rounds in, in like two months. So ABC in two months. Uh, here, it never, never happened. I mean, uh, define a hot deal in China here are very different. By hot, in China, by hot, you can, you can market it as a very hot company. Why is that? Why, why is it so easy for There's them to? There's just too much, uh, maybe RMB in, yeah. in, in, in China uh, flow into the equity market. Uh, that never happened before. So past five years, there's new VC firms who jump out from Sequoia China, IDG China, and my LPs, they found their new fund. And then they kind of uh, educate all these family office and traditional LPs, and kind of educate the government how to do equity investment. And this phenomenon never happened in humans, uh, humans history. So there's like trillions of dollars. I mean, it may be in, uh, in China. So totally different. Uh, maybe your theory of less rigor is less the rigor. polite True. theory. Yeah, right. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. I'm Marty Zhu. I'm also a 2018 uh, Fenba graduate. I'm Dee's classmate, actually. Um, I have two questions, and both of them kind of relates to that theme that he just mentioned. Last summer, as part of our thesis project, I went to China to do a market entry consulting uh, project under the school's framework. And I talked to a venture capital firm. Mm -hmm. And they told me, whose name will remain anonymous, who told me that we're looking just for the team. Like, it doesn't matter what your product is, it doesn't matter your market, we're looking at the team. Yeah. Now, how does that differ across the border, and how does that affect your decision in which firm to invest in? And you want to answer that first, and I'll go for the uh, second yeah. question. Uh, I'll, I'll just go first, because this is pretty generic. Uh, it's a pretty general question in terms of uh, the mindset of an investor. When we invest, it's always early, so we don't have much but to look at the team and see if uh, they have the right metal to really grow this to what they promise they will turn it into. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by world-class uh, you know, C-level teams, so we have a pretty good benchmark of what to look for and what not to look for. Um, I think, you know, if you're an if you're an investor and you're saying we're just interested in team, you're kind of doing your LPs a little bit of a disservice, right? And, and then you also have to qualify it by what do you mean when you look at just for the team, right? Like one of the better indicators for a company being successful is if the founding team have, has had a prior exit or at least have, has started a company before, right? So we like people who are experienced, whether they've had a successful exit or if their company flamed out. Even if they flamed out, they may even learn more or they may have a chip on their shoulder or at least they know the rigors of building a business. So for us, that's a good signal for uh, whether we should invest in a team. The other thing that uh, I like to do, and you know, my partners can speak for themselves, is uh, I always look for areas that uh, if I had the time or the inclination or the will to actually start my next company, is that the company that I would build, right? And are those the, the founders that I would want to have on my C-level team? So, uh, because I think at the end of the day, I feel like if we invest in your company and it doesn't do well, then at least I know that I can jump in at least uh, and try to figure it out because I was excited about the industry that it plays in and I was happy about some elements of the team where I'm sort of like, this is a good investment. I would invest my time and my money into this. So that's how I usually take a pitch meeting early on. Okay. Wait, can you add a few comments to that? Uh, yeah, so by Chinese VC looking teams, it's pretty easy to understand because there's so many, like there's billions of entrepreneurs, right? If you open a restaurant, you call yourself 
entrepreneur. So for VCs in China, it's, uh, it's an easy way to filter, the, uh, filter them just through checking their background, right? If you graduate from top schools and you, you have some sort of entrepreneur experience, you stand out. So yeah. like, there's so much competition in China. So by comparing team itself, you can filter the best deal you are chasing. So if I'm VC in China, I'll, I'll definitely pick the, I, I, look, I just, I can invest through by person, easy.